Okay, guys, let's go ahead and begin. What I wanted to do is to discuss uh, any questions, again, that you might have with respect to the problems that you're turning in or the Excel assignment that you're turning in. And then I want to move back into forecasting. I'm not going to spend any time really talking about forecasting revenue. I want to continue on our forecasting of expenses. And I know you started to do this on Excel, some of you. You may have finished that, perhaps not. Uh, but I want to make sure that we not only are able to do it in Excel, but I want to make sure you understand what's going on because you're almost certain to have an opportunity to do it without Excel. Okay? Uh, and then I, then I want to think about how we introduce adjustments into some of our forecasting. Okay? So right now we're looking at things with a constant returns to scale scenario. And I want to introduce adjustments that conceivably could take us outside of constant returns to scale, or not, all right? So with that, what questions do you have, either with the problem set you're just turning in, or the Excel assignment that you're posting up today? Yeah, Garrett. With number 11, um, when you like start using the heat value generator equation, and like using ROCs, like reading your answers when you talk about like a sensitivity analysis, is that so much like, like when ROC changes, like, a little bit, like the value you're going to get is going to change a lot, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. like every little change in ROC amounts to a big change in value. So that's true. I think more generalized, anytime you're applying a ratio, so let's face it, a percentage is a ratio, right? Anytime you're applying a ratio to a large number, a small change in the ratio can create a big change in the number, right? Okay. And so these performance metrics like WAC, like ROIC, uh, just because of that, they have that ability to change in a large way. But even more so when you think about where they exist in the equation, right? And so in this case, ROIC comes into the equation in the continuing value form, it's in the numerator. And we use it as a divisor for G, right? G divided by ROIC. And remember, that's 1 minus G divided by ROIC. So if G is less than ROIC, it's 1 minus a number less than 1, right? So you're now going to multiply uh, no plat by a number less than 1, so it's going to reduce the value of the numerator. You've got an extra sensitivity issue in here because ROIC is a divisor for G. And it's not a standalone variable, right? It's an interactive variable at the very least. So it's not simply ROIC's dynamic. It's also the relation, relational dynamic between G and ROIC, which is why I pointed out the other day that the condition that will yield consistently positive valuation outcomes is when ROIC is greater than WAC, is greater than G. And if you think about the way the equation is set, having this condition met of ROIC being greater than WAC, being greater than G, then will give you consistently positive results here, right? But is that can, do we force that condition to be met so that we can get positive results? Well, we can't. We're, we're, just, we're now synthesizing evaluation and making a guess, not even a credible guess. We, we've customized it. You never change your inputs to get a different output. You use the real inputs and interpret the output. Okay. So, so that's the condition we need to meet, but it also speaks of something to us. If a company is growing at a rate that is greater than either of these values, that all by itself doesn't mean something. If a company is growing greater than its return on capital, it's consuming its capital by its growth, and it may outgrow its capital. So when we have a negative free cash flow, as we do in this scenario, 
I think my free cash flow is negative 0.084. So it's only barely negative in this base here, but it's negative. What does that mean? And is that expressly bad? Well, I think you have to consider why it's negative, Zach. But, but, so, just a second, Brian. I think you have to consider why it's negative and look at what could cause it to be negative. So, doesn't that mean that you'll have to uh, drum up more capital in future years if you want to continue growing at that rate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, you're, if your growth is have out-consumed your capital, or if, or if it's negative, and is consuming your capital, at some point, if it doesn't turn positive, it's going to out-consume your capital, and you're going to need more capital, right? So I think we have to first think about why is it negative? Uh, remember uh, that this is one of the equations for free cash flow. The other one is, um, is no plat plus depreciation minus change in networking capital minus net capital spending. So, if no plat is negative, which means EBIT was negative, right? For no plat to be negative, EBIT has to have been negative. Now a negative free cash flow is no bueno. Okay, now that spells trouble. Because now it's not simply negative because you're, out, you're growing faster than your, uh, than your cash flow can support. Now it's that you're not making any money. And that's, that's a whole, that, that's a problem all by its lonesome. I can, I can excuse a company whose growth, which I can see here in the change in their working capital and net capital spending, right? I can excuse a company whose growth is outstripping its, its cash flow or its, its revenues, its, its EBIT, its no plat. In fact, maybe I can not only excuse it, I might applaud it, right? If it's got a plan to raise capital. But a company who's simply losing money, I won't excuse or applaud. Now, if it's in its earliest days, and it's losing money, and it knows it was going to lose money, or, and because it's on its way to making money, or if it's in a revival mode where it's decided to kind of re-engineer itself, so we're going to have a year or two of losses before we start making money again, I might excuse that. But there's got to be a really good reason for this. Have I discussed with you Discover Card with this, in, in this vein of losing money, making money? Probably not. So some of you know that uh, uh, many, many years ago, I worked for a company by the name of Dean Witter, uh, and I happened to be working in New York uh, at, at the time. And you might recall that Dean Witter at that time in history was a holding of Sears. Okay? It was a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Sears, the retailing giant that barely exists anymore. So was Coldwell Banker, and so was H&R Block, and a whole bunch of other financially oriented companies. And somebody had a great idea. Visa and MasterCard were making money hand over fist, and so was American Express. So why doesn't another company come into the marketplace with a competing instrument? So Sears decided to create the Discover Card. And they decided to do so from within the framework of Dean Witter. So it started as a Dean Witter project and later was spun off. And at the point that it was getting ready to be to set up in its own shell, if you will, a guy by the name of Rich Martini was appointed to be the president of the company, and he had to present to the board and a number of other officers, uh, of which I happened to have been one at the time, uh, but what the operating plan was, and we were aghast when he said that we were going to lose $250 million on this in the first year. So that's not nothing. I don't care who you are. And certainly back in the early 1980s, right? That was a lot more mid-1980s, a lot of money. And then he followed that up by saying we're going to lose $250 million in the second year. And in the third year, we think we're going to lose, I, I think in the third year, I think we're going to break even. And then in the fourth year, we're going to make some money. And he went on to show these extraordinary profits that would come. But nobody in the room was getting past, we're going to lose half a billion dollars before we turn a dime in profit. And in 1987, half a billion dollars is probably the equivalent of what? Three billion today, something in that magnitude. So I don't care who you are, that's a lot of money. Well, as it turns out, uh, Dean Witter or Discover went on to lose $250 million in the first year. 
In their second year, they, they came close to breaking even, so way ahead. In fact, they had about a $100 million loss, which is close to breaking even when you lost 250 the year before, right? And in the third year, they didn't lose money, they didn't break even, they posted a small profit, it's been nothing but profits in the sense. Those could be excused. Its free cash flow was extraordinarily negative, right? When you have an operating loss at 250, there's no way that your free cash flow can be positive. It just isn't possible. But that you can excuse because it had a plan that was credible and, and that was well thought out and it had all, it had access to virtually unlimited amounts of capital because it was a wholly owned subsidiary of what at the time was still the nation's uh, retailing giant. Kmart existed, Walmart existed, but neither of them had rivaled Sears yet. Okay? And today Sears is an after. Now, can you even think of a Sears facility in the state that's open? I can think of a couple that just have the name on it that they put it closed. Yeah, it's an afterthought. Okay, that said, if no plaque's negative, we're in deep stuff. If G over ROIC is positive, or is greater than 1, so G is greater than ROIC, it causes this term to be negative which then causes the numerator to be negative. And even if the denominator happens to be positive, we said, oh, we got a negative term, right? But that's not necessarily horrible. It simply means that our growth rate is, is greater than our return on capital, and at some point, we're going to outstrip our capital. We're going to consume all of our capital unless we turn that around, right? Change it at some point. And you can change it by slowing down growth, or you can change it by increasing return on capital. But it signals, at some point, we're probably going to need some outside capital, okay? Which isn't all that bad by itself. Again, we've talked about this. The relationship between WAC and G looks like a really important relationship. It's not. It's other than algebraically, okay? It's the G and ROIC relationship that becomes a big deal here. And it's the WAC and ROIC relationship that's a big deal. And the, I guess the, the theory of transitivity would cause then all of these ways of lined up to have to be uh, a meaningful relation. Does that help at all? Hopefully a little bit, maybe not. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is our base here. What do we have to do to figure out revenues for 2017? Okay, so apparently we need a forecast ratio for sales. Okay, so I'm going to say we've got to have an FR sales of some kind or revenue. And I, what did we just say this was? Did we say it's 8.6 percent? Yes. And then that's going to let us have revenue for 2017, right? We're going to take the 2016 number times one plus 0.086. It's going to give us seven. How do we then get the expense in this, this expense category, operating expenses without depreciation? How do we find that number from 2017? Anybody is welcome to answer. Zach? Well, you can take it from your base here, so the operating expense as a percent of revenue. Okay, so I want a forecast ratio. You do, right? For this year, right? And yes. Would you do your uh, off your financial statement? You would do your uh, overhead, which I guess would be your sales and admin. Would you add cogs of that, but divide that by income? In this case, I've tried to simplify this, Brigham. So we're taking, we're, we're using only Enough. two expense categories. Okay. However. In other um, versions of this that you will do, you will create a forecast ratio for each one of your expense categories. Okay, okay. okay? You don't want to take and aggregate them the way I'm doing this just to show you the methodology. And you'll see in a few minutes why that is. It'll okay. Become more, uh, more plain to you. But you want to create a separate ratio for every one of your expense categories. I'll also tell you that if you're doing a very rigorous sales forecast, and if you have, say, five lines of revenues on your income statement, uh, 
rents, royalties, consulting, service, product sales, what have you, you probably want to do a different sales forecast for each one of them and then a weighted average perhaps to get to your whole or something like it. I think towards the end I show or towards the end of the semester, I show you that kind of a matrix. I don't think I ever require you to replicate it, but if we're if we've got five different revenue uh, um, models, we want to be able to forecast each one of them, right? Because we can have different growths in each one of them. So we're going to have a uh, forecast ratio, and then it was something like 0.95 something, if I remember correctly, because we're going to take the expense for the base year divided by the revenue for the base year. That's going to give us the ratio. We do the same thing, forecast ratio for depreciation, which I think was 0.015, something like that. Yep. Okay, and it keeps going, right? Mm -hmm. And again, the expense divided by the revenue, it gives me the ratio. So now, if I know my revenue for the next year, which which is what? Okay, some of you have it right in front of you. What's my revenue for 2017? Say again, please. 275. Thank you. If I know the revenue for the base year or for the next year, now how do I calculate the expense? Multiply. Yeah. So I take this new revenue times that ratio to get this expense and this expense in each case. And then I'm going to calculate EBIT by, I know EBIT is revenue minus my operating expenses. So that goes me calculate EBIT. Let's me calculate no plat. So I'm going to take EBIT times one minus my tax rate. How do I calculate interest expense, though? How do I? What you do, I don't know if this is the right one, but what I did is I picked up the interest expense, what we have shown on year 2016, and I divided it by the interest-bearing debt. For what year? I would assume it would be the year in the past, but... Good assumption. Okay. In fact, we always use interest paid in year one divided by debt in year zero. Okay. Or interest paid year two divided by debt in year one. Michael, why is that? Why isn't it interest paid in year one divided by debt in year one? Because uh, you want to see the change? Pardon me? Because you want to see the change? No, not expressly. Anybody else? Do any of you uh, have a, own your own home or have a car that you make a payment on? Okay. You, so when you make your car payment, you're paying some interest, right? Is, are you paying interest on the dollar amount of the loan on the day that you make your payment? Yeah. Or is the interest calculated well, on the dollar amount of the loan over the last that. period of time? That's why. So we pay interest today on something in the past. And that's just a basic way interest is calculated. It's the convention for interest calculation. So in this case, it's going to be the same. Now, even then, it's not a perfect measure, but I guess a perfect measure is one out the window, right? I guess. So the, the ratio for interest, the forecast ratio for interest, is equal to interest paid at one divided by debt at zero. So apparently, we need to calculate debt. Well, you already have it for zero. Yeah. Well, well, yes, but we could do it here, but then when we go to 2018, oh. we're, we're going to have the problem. Okay. So at some point, we're going to have to calculate debt, right? How do we figure out what debt is for 2017? Is there a forecast ratio for it? Not expressly. This is where we have to start making some assumptions. And so our basic assumption in the way we're looking at this at the moment is a constant returns to scale, which simply means as the company expands, all as its revenue expands, all of its expense categories expand in the exact same proportions so that our returns to scale don't change. If our return was 5%, when it was this big, it's 5% when it's this big, okay? Which is not a good assumption when you're dealing with a small company, right? 
because hopefully as it gets bigger, its input costs go down as a, a, a per unit or as a percentage of its revenues, and we become more and more efficient. I mean, how many times, do, how many CEOs do we need for the company? How many parking lots do we need for the company as it gets bigger? Well, probably only the one we already have, so we can gain some efficiencies. But if we're already a company at maximum scale or optimal scale, getting bigger doesn't give that to us. And so we probably do have a constant returns to scale when we're already really big, like the companies in the S&P 100 and the Dow 30. I think I told you that if you look at those companies, there's a remarkable relationship and consistent between growth in revenues and growth in invested capital. And there's a remarkable relationship <coughs> between invested capital changes and debt changes. Okay? It directly correlated. So something else is at play here in this assumption we're making. We might be able to very easily understand why as a company's revenues grow, is invested capital might have to grow. That's kind of easy. Uh, if I am a printing company and I want to double my printing revenue, I've got to double my printing output, I probably need another printer, right? So I have to double my printing capital, if you will. That's easy. But does that mean that we have to double our debt if we have debt? No, we can buy that new piece of capital and the new equipment by using cash, by uh, raising more money in the equity markets if we wanted to. So why is it that we see that as companies' revenues grow and their invested capital grows, that their debt changes something similarly? What's at issue there? Well, you're just saying that you're assuming that because they're growing, number one, that they're not paying down their debt. That's okay. capital and create growth. There is. And when you take out debt, you hope that you make an initial investment in something that's going to allow you to grow without having to necessarily grow that debt. So well, that's all true. I'm not sure it's exactly what I'm trying to get to, but that is all accurate. Think about this. Is the decision to borrow money to meet a need versus raise money in the equity markets to meet a need versus use some of our own cash to meet a need. Is that a discretionary decision or is that a necessary decision? Is, is it already scripted for us? It's discretionary, right? So if a company is showing that as their invested capital grows, their debt grows at a similar pace, they're evidencing an appetite for a certain amount of leverage, right? The board of trustees, the senior management, etc., is evidencing that they're comfortable with having a certain level of debt and so as a percentage of their operational capacity, as a percentage of their revenue, invest capital, whatever. It's an appetite for a certain amount of leverage, which might mean that it's also an appetite for a certain level of risk. As leverage changes in a company, does risk change as well? In fact, it's almost intuitive, right? Why? Why does risk change when leverage changes? If I borrow more money than I had borrowed in the past as a proportion of my operation, why am I a riskier company? I've never missed a payment. I have plenty of cash on hand. Why am I a riskier company? Why am I likely to have more volatile performance? Yes, but what is it about carrying it? If you have Garrett? the same likelihood of not repaying something, like the amount repaid has just become greater. So rather than repaying $10. Okay. So if I, if I don't have a track record of always paying my bills on time, and, and I borrow more, I've now amplified an existing problem. That's true. There's something else here, but that's true. Zach? Does that have to do with that? Um, no, I mean, I guess it's possible it has to do with that, because some debts are callable, some are not, okay? But a consumer debt likely is not callable. You take out a 30-year mortgage on your, uh, on your home, 20, uh, when, you're, when you're 10 years into it in the 20th year, uh, if you've been making your payments on time, the bank probably doesn't have the right to call the loan, right? 
But in commercial lending, call, call rights are very common. And they're typically not completely discretionary. They're set by benchmarks. Uh, if you fall outside of this ratio, your revenues change. Well, you know, they're benchmarks. You have a substantial change in ownership sometimes will cause it to be called. There's something else at play here, though. So if I increase my debt, I've also almost certainly increased my debt servicing payments, haven't I? My interest payments, my mortgage payments, whatever they are, have gone up. When my, mortgage, when my debt servicing payments go up, they are a greater drag on my overall revenues, right? And if I happen to have a bobble in my revenues, I run into a bad year, then I may have put myself in a situation where I can't make that extra debt service payment, and that's why the leverage is makes us riskier. Because it gives us another commitment that we must meet. And, and if we don't, we create a problem. That's why. Okay. Or it's the, it's the uh, technical one. I think all the other reasons you mentioned are, are worthwhile reasons. Okay, so that said, I think I told you that there's a, a very strong relationship between revenue and invested capital. So I'm going to tell you that you need to make an assumption when you're doing a uh, constant returns, and you need to find out what your invested capital to revenue ratio is for the base year. And since there's a strong relationship between invested capital and debt, I'd like you to think about a debt to invested capital ratio, again, for the base year. Which isn't expressly a forecast ratio the way a textbook would define it, but functionally it's a forecast ratio, isn't it? So now, if I know what my revenue is going to be, if I know what invested capital is going to be, if I know what um, my ratio is and what my revenue is, now I can forecast invested capital by taking the revenue for this year and multiply it by the ratio that I have said is constant. And once I know my invested capital, I can take that invested capital times the ratio that I've said is constant, and I can find my debt, which lets me then find interest for yet the next year, right? If you saw the inside of my models, which at some point you will, you'll see that I don't increase invested capital at the rate of sales. I change my invested capital based upon this ratio applied to that revenue, which means I kind of, by default, am changing it at the rate of sales, but that's not what my equation looks like. And you'll, you'll better understand why in a moment. Okay? Similarly, I don't move debt value at the rate of sales, but if invested capital moved as a function of sales, then debt's moving in a function of sales. I don't show that formula in this cell. I show this ratio times that invested capital to get debt. I show this ratio times that revenue to get invested capital. It lets me then, after the fact, if I have any adjustments to make, it lets me apply an adjustment that if I move these things forward at the rate of sales, I'd have to be making adjustments to my sales rate in order to adjust my expenses and my capital. I want to do that. What I'd love is my revenue, my sales, to rise at a faster rate than these other items are rising. Greater? On the uh, assumed constant, like, do you, uh -huh. um, do, do you multiply one of them and divide one of them, or are they both multiplied? Yeah, in fact, I said the other day, and, and I do it different ways, different times. It doesn't matter if you have debt divided by invested capital or invested capital divided by debt. Makes no difference at all. Okay. It creates a ratio that's constant, okay. and then I can use that. So if I did uh, invested capital divided by debt, and I'm trying to then find my new debt, I would have to then re and so let's say that just creates a ratio. I just have to rearrange this equation to solve for debt, okay? Which, that's the same thing I'm doing here too, right? So in this case, it would become debt is equal to, I think it's revenue divided by invested capital, is that right? Mm. Or did I do that backwards? 
I know, so I know the invested capital one is you do yeah. revenue divided by the, the ratio. So the other so, one's time. Yeah, so this the, one is multiplication. invested capital divided by revenue. Divided by ratio, my ratio. You shouldn't put R there. I just put X for ratio. Okay. So it doesn't matter whether you use, it doesn't matter which is numerator or which is denominator. It creates a ratio and then you use that as kind of a model to find the other value. Okay? And all of this is headed towards free cash flow, right? I've said though that I'm changing my net working capital and my fixed assets by my rate of revenue, haven't I? I've said that expressly. But I've said invested capital, which is now working capital plus fixed assets, I'm changing as a function of this constant relationship. So I've created a bit of friction here, haven't I? I've got an incongruity. I'm saying take these and move them forward at the rate of sales. But this is not calculated that way. This is taken as a function of this ratio. When I say this, I mean in, the, in this year, in the 2017 in this case. How do I resolve that incongruity? Well, in a constant returns to scale world, is it incongruous? Or does it get the same numbers? In a constant returns to scale world, it gives the same numbers. Because if the change in revenue is really what's driving this invested capital, and it is, then the change in revenue can drive these, and this plus this will still equal this. So in a constant returns world, I haven't created an incongruity. But if I change my ratio, or if I make an adjustment to my expectation, and this still moves forward at the rate of sales growth or revenue growth, now I have perhaps created an incongruity between these two values being added together and this value. We'll, we'll, when we start to model that change, you'll see how we resolve the incongruity. Okay? Any questions about that? Can you explain and just explain? Yep. So for this 2017 interest, I'm going to take this ratio multiplied by the prior year debt to give me the 2017 interest. Because the, because, the, because the equation is interest at time one divided by debt at time zero. That's the ratio. And ratios are simply an assumption just like this and this are assumptions, right? And I said that these aren't expressly forecast ratios because textbooks don't call them that, but they're an assumed value that we can use to interact with some other known number to get a new number, right? It's a ratio. It's a forecast ratio of a sort. Please, Bruce. And then my question on the depreciation ratio, so I, you just did it with those numbers up there, but are we like able to go back to the past financial statement, or do you prefer that we go off of these? Didn't even need to. Take this. Okay divided by this. So the base year, my forecast ratio is always going to be some expense in year one, or excuse me, zero, divided by some revenue in year zero. So in this case, the expense was operating uh, expenses. In this case, it was depreciation. Okay. So it's just some expense to buy by some rate revenue, and here was the revenue, right? And that gives me a ratio. Now, if I have five different expense categories, I've got five different ratios, right? But they're always going to be constructed that way, except for the forecast ratio for interest, which is the interest expense in year one divided by the debt in year or excuse me, instruments in year zero in this case, divided by the debt in the prior year or year minus one. So you actually would have to go back to 2015 in your balance sheet to figure it out to get the ratio here that's going to govern what's going to happen in this next year. 
Okay. You with me, Alex? Any question about how I flesh out this next line? Uh, 2017. So for our Excel, we should only have like about four ratios that we've gotten forecast ratios, and then we should be able to solve the rest by using. I think those. that's true. Okay. You, you need to have a um, you need to have a sales forecast. Okay. You need to have or when I say sales, I mean revenue, revenue right? Revenue. The revenue forecast. You have a forecast ratio for each of your expense categories. I gave you I only gave you two. You need to ultimately have a interest ratio. Okay. And then you need to have a couple of assumed constant ratios that are reflections of constant returns to state. Okay. And then the rest should be able to just... And the rest works off of, off of that. Okay. Okay? So let's take it a step further then. In fact, would somebody please give me the number for 2017 operating expense without interest and the number for depreciation? I'm sorry, speak up please, Sherry. Uh, the operating expenses is two hundred sixty-one point eight three four six. Okay, and depreciation? Uh, four point oh one five six seven eight four. We're gonna call it four point oh two. What's EBIT then? Uh, thirteen point eight six two. Okay. What if I believe that as we got bigger? our operating expenses didn't continue to grow at the same rate as our revenue. That we actually were able to find some adjustment to that. Either because we're a better owner of the company than its current owners and we might run a tighter ship financially, we get some efficiencies. Or because we think we have a scale economy here as we're producing more units, we should get better prices for our inputs. Or, um, or we're being merged into another company and uh, and maybe we don't have to pay for uh, two production managers or two CFOs or whatever it happens to be. We've introduced somewhere, somehow, an efficiency. How do we model that? Can we just change the forecast ratio? Would that, would that do it? If it was 95, can we say now it's 94? We could do that, couldn't we? Okay. So let, go ahead and give me, if you would, a number that is 275.45 times 0.94. Give that to me if you would. Okay. Now give me a different number. Take 261.83 and multiply it by 0.99. 261.83 multiplied by 0.99. If I tell you that I think I can get a 1% reduction in my expense, for in a particular category, which of the numbers that I've calculated is accurate? Which of these offered a 1% reduction in our expense category? Remember it grew first. That one, Nicole? Yeah. Why? You're right. Why? Because I took <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's a valid answer. Okay, so to get this number, the black number, 259.22, I took my forecasted expense and I reduced it by 1%, didn't I? When I multiplied it by 0.99, that's the same thing as reducing it by 1%, right? Did I take a 1% reduction on the growth the grown expense number to get to this? Or did I shave one point off of the ratio? If I take one point off of this, I start at a 0.95 and I take one, per, one point off of it, so I go to 0.94, is that a 1% reduction in this number or is it more than a 1% reduction? It's a nominal reduction of 1%, right? 
but it's a proportional reduction of greater than 1%. Because it's 1% 1 of 95. Exactly. Instead of 1% 1 of 100. 1% 1 of 100, I'm good either way, right? But this number isn't 100. And then numbers are never going to be 100. Your expense ratio can never be 100. Otherwise, that one expense category wiped out your entire revenue and you're done, right? So when you're starting to think about introducing adjustments, the first thing you do is you calculate the number that is the revenue times the ratio, and then you do the reduction. So to get the expense in your I, I'm going to take the revenue for your I times the forecast ratio for that expense category, and then I'm going to multiply that by 1 minus my adjustment. And that gives me a proportionately accurate value. Why? Because when I tell you I got a 1% reduction in something, we think proportion. We don't think nominality, do we? If I tell you I had something reduced by 50%, we don't think, well, it started at 0.67, so a reduction of 50% takes it down to 0.17. That's not how we think. We think it was 100% and we reduced it by 50, so it's half. So you have to be consistent in your methodology. So when we introduce a, some, uh, some adjustments, I'll show you this in a, in a spreadsheet in just a moment. When we introduce adjustments, the first thing we do is find the number that is the revenue times the, uh, the forecast ratio, and then we take the proportional adjustment. Or if we're introducing an adjustment to one of our other assumptions, then we take and find out what should the number have been without the adjustment, and then apply the proportional adjustment. An alternative way of doing it is we could have taken the 0.95 and multiplied it by 1 minus the adjustment, right? Then applied it to the revenue. That would get you to the same number. So it doesn't make a difference as to which one you use, but I'll teach you to do it this way. It gets you to the same number. And I just think this makes a little bit better intuitive sense. Any questions about that? Okay, step further then. I'll show this to you in a minute so I can make sure you don't have questions. In the meantime, you, I know you do. Oh, I don't wish you hadn't brought that up quite yet. Don't worry, stay with me. The projector actually gave us lights faster than I thought it might. to just change, make adjustments to my expense categories, I'll go ahead and calculate the expense based upon the ratio and then take the adjustment. If I've done that, have I taken myself into a changing return to scale world or am I still at a constant return? I'm still at a constant, aren't I? What because I didn't create an efficiency based upon my use of my capital, okay? In order to introduce a changing returns, I've got to introduce an adjustment to my assumptions, which also means I've got to introduce an adjustment to networking capital and fixed assets, okay? So let me show you some of that.
So this is what you're working on, right? This is the model that you've got with the 2016 values, the forecast ratios, the assumptions, the WAC and all, and everything. Okay? And in each of these expense categories, cells, I've simply done exactly as I've told you. And we've taken the revenue we calculated for the year, multiplied by the ratio to give us the new expense. Okay? And in the capital categories, I've taken then the constant ratio that we identified, interacted it with the other part of the equation to solve for the capital I'm working on. Okay? So this is one you're looking at. By the way, this is linked for you in Canvas already. I'll show you guys at the end where you can find it. You'll notice I have two other uh, tabs here. I've got a valuation without adjustments, which looks a little bit different than what you're looking at right there, but only because I've disaggregated the expense categories. Instead of only having two, one for everything without depreciation and then depreciation, I've got three in this case. Okay? It's the only difference here. We've got the same ratios, doesn't look like it. You were using 0.95 here, but if you take this plus this, which is all the expenses other than depreciation, that's 0.95, and we've got our point our 1.5 here still. Okay. So this is the exact same thing. If I now look at the spreadsheet tab that's got adjustments. I have my same forecast ratios, right? And I've introduced what says right here as best owner premium, because that happens to be the type of adjustment that I was calculating. But, the best, but they're just adjustments. If I move, <clears throat> excuse me, these adjustment figures, and you'll see how I, how I came up with them or really how I executed them a few minutes, in a moment. If I move them to zeros, then these numbers in the forecast are exactly the same numbers as they are in the valuation without the adjustments. When I move the adjustments to zero, right? Makes sense. But now, I can look at this and say, you know what? I'm going to value this company based upon the belief, the forecast, the plans of the current ownership which took us to an 8.6% sales forecast and used their base year ratios to forecast all of our expenses, which if we then model all of this, let's me come down and look at some valuations, right? Well, this is a bad news scenario going on here. I got a negative value, negative 42.24. I said a few minutes ago that having a negative free cash flow wasn't necessarily bad. Here, that's the 0.084 negative free cash flow, state negative. But it came up with a negative value. Is there anything good about negative value? No, in fact, expressly bad. What would Demoterans say if we have to find if we have free, negative free cash flows to begin with? Do you remember? He said it in the videos you watched. It's okay to start with a negative free cash flow, but if you can't get this in relatively short order to a point of having a positive free cash flow, the business has no value. Well, in this case, we don't get it there. So in this case, the way that it's currently constructed, I wouldn't buy this business. You'd have to pay me to take the business off your hand, right? So it has a negative value. You don't sell it to someone. You give it to them and pay them for the heartache you're about to cause them or the bankruptcy you're about to put in front of them, or something like that, right? So in this case, I like this business for a lot of reasons, but man, I can't stomach this negative. So how do I think about this? 
Well, I think maybe that if I take this business and introduce it into my own, maybe I can find some more revenue. Maybe when I put this business into my business, I introduce my existing company customers to this business's products. So an existing customer group, a new set of products, do you think I can increase some sales by doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I think so, right? And maybe I take that company's customers and introduce them to my products. So maybe I've got some additional sales synergy there. And maybe all of that only gives me a 2% proportional improvement in my revenues, but that's better than nothing, right? I still have problems in my free cash flow. Please. Is that 2% going on top of the forecast ratio that's already there? Good question. No. Okay. All of my numbers, oh, no, excuse me, I think that that's not accurate with respect to sales. Bear with me just a moment. You're good. I think it is when it's sales. Ah, excuse me. I didn't just. Something's not properly aligned in this role. I apologize. I think. Yeah, my I have a I have a columnar misalignment. It makes it a little harder to read than it should. Because uh, this forecast ratio is going with this expense category. Somehow I did, they're not lined up the way they were or I thought I had. I apologize. So in this case, as I come to this revenue uh, for the first year, I've only increased it by, yep, okay. In the first year, I only increased it by my forecast ratio of, as for sales. In the second year, I gave it a best owner premium. And if you look at my footnotes, you'd start to see why. Because in this case, I believed that my sales synergies wouldn't start to affect me until the second year. Okay. So wait, so does it does it tack on top of that percentage? And and it in this case would. Trying trying to think of the best way to say this to you. So I've, got, I've got something else going on in, in this you, cell. Okay. okay yeah. Um. So so let's let me change something real quick, and then let me. Um, then let me re it, it, come back to this. It'll take me just a minute. You'll understand in a moment what I'm doing. I'm like, you know, I'm sorry. Can you do a lot? Were you previously adding the premium twice? Hang on. The, I set this up for a particular scenario, and I'm trying to generalize it for you now. Okay. So what I have done, if you look at what's going on here, is I have gone ahead and I've taken this times one plus each of these two values. And so I took a 2% nominal increase in sales, not proportional. Okay? But what I just did in all those changes was to 
suggest something else to you that might be worth thinking about how to model. So Mason, you have come into this business, you're, no, you're buying this business, putting it into your own, and you believe that you're going to be able to expose your existing customers to my products and my customers to your products. And it's going to give you a 2% increase in sales when you do that. And this, in this case, I'm saying it's 2% nominal change. Okay? Do you believe that for every year following, remember that the year following is built on the year before, for every year following, you'll also always see that 2%. So will it be a persistent change, or is it likely that it's a short-term change in proportion? But once it's there, it doesn't go away. Another way of thinking about it is when your customer has been introduced to my products and my customers have been introduced to yours, that introduction and their willingness to buy probably stays persistent, but we're not introducing them anew every year, are we? We're not. So think about how persistent some of these changes might be. I'm going to tell you that best owner premium adjustments with respect to revenues have to be thought about in terms of persistency. So what you're going to see that I've modeled here is I'm saying in my first year, I believe we're going to get the sales increase the company thought plus another nominal 2%. In the second year, I'm saying that I think we're going to get the 8.6% the company believed plus half of this adjustment. Because I think in the first year we get most of the benefit of this synergy. In the second year we get a little bit. And the way I've modeled this, in the third year, excuse me, by the third year, the synergistic value of this disappeared. Bring it. And is that all just assumptions? These are assumptions. Okay. So remember as I've told you that Using models and templates is great, but you got to know what's going on with them so that you can adjust those based upon your situation. So this is another question kind of for like real purpose use. So if you're a person buying this company, you're really, like at, at its current state, you're realistically just thinking that you can make it better. Like you're... In this case. Okay. But there's two ways for me to have done this, right? Could I not simply have come up here and put 2% additional in, in my, and made my sales adjustment here as a best owner premium, in which case I would have gone from 8.6% in sales growth to 10.6%. I could have, and it would have given me the same number in year two, right? Or year one, actually. Okay. But that would be suggestive that I thought that 2% benefit was persistent. And I don't think it is. So I've added my change down here. See, I've added, it, I've added it so that it reflects down here to allow myself the ability to make it persistent or not, which means I sometimes have to change how these are structured depending upon whether it's persistent or not or how long it's persistent. Maybe it was 2% and I thought I got all of that 2% in the first year. I got two thirds of it in the second year, one third of it in the third, and by the end of the third year it disappeared. I think that's a plausible story, right? If I thought I had a best owner premium because of innovation and bringing some new products to market that the old owners didn't think about, well, that one might be persistent, right? In which case, I would have modeled it up in the upper right-hand corner under the best owner premium up there instead. So just think about where these things would sit in a model and how you might have to change them or manipulate them based upon your story. Let's go into the expense category for a minute. So here in the expenses, you'll see I've got the revenue times the ratio times one minus a change. And I, my change right now is zero, so it's times one, right? One minus zero is one. If I now say, you know, I really think of my cost of goods sold, I think I can find a 1% cost efficiency. 
either because we are more efficient with the way we're using our inputs, or we're more efficient with the way we're buying them, or we have less waste, or something like that. I think I can find a 1% benefit there. Look what happened to my free cash flow. Can you go back and forth? Yeah, I will. I was negative, not very negative. I'm pretty close to a break even on free cash flow, right? I was negative, and I said a 1% proportional reduction in my cost of goods sold, and I go from negative to positive. Okay. Um, in this case, I think I want to also model a 1% change in my sales, in, or some change in my sales and administration expense. In fact, that's probably easier to get a reduction in expenses there than it is cost of goods sold, right? How many sales managers do I need for this one combined company? Can the same group of sales representatives selling company A's products now represent company B's products to the same customers? Can I get rid of company B's sales force? Or combine them in the efficient way or something? How many secretaries do I need? How many CFOs do I need? Can I take the facility that we have for the new company, the one that's being bought, can I rent it out or sell it and move the, that new company we're buying into our existing facility? Maybe you're saying, well, maybe you can do that for some, but you've got two different production lines. Fine, let me have one production line work for or run in the day and another production line at night. Let me use my capital facility more efficiently. So I think it's even easier to find a proportional benefit there when you're combining firms than it is elsewhere. So let's say we found a 2% there. Notice what happens to free cash flow. These are massive changes. These are not insignificant. And here's how I can prove to you they're massive changes. I'm going to put them all back for a second. And notice that I have a negative $42 million value right here using the free cash flow model. Negative $42 million value. Not good. I increase my sales. And I still got negative, negative, negative 13.6, not as negative, but still negative is negative, right? If I can find an efficiency, even a little one, I go from negative 13 point whatever it was to positive 61.8 million dollars by a 1% change in my input cost. Now it happens to be an input cost. They represented 83.37% of my revenue, so that's why it was so dynamic, right? If I didn't find a change there, I only found one in my operating or my sales and administrative expenses of 1%, I'm still negative. Maybe I can maybe I have to find 2%. <coughs> now I got a little bit positive. Can you see how a tool like this lets you think about how changes in your work environment, changing your expenses, your revenue, your capital structure, etc., can let you model changes in value to your stakeholders. Is it valuable to do that? I would tell you that a well-run company of any substance at all that is considering a major change and that doesn't model that change and its effect on its stakeholders is irresponsible and if I was one of the stakeholders and it affected me negatively, I have, the, I have rights to have a fiduciary lawsuit on my hands. I can sue the management. Do companies, stakeholders ever sue their management? Absolutely, all the time. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole nexus of activist investors. Is an activist investor comes in and is going to affect some change because the company knows that if they don't, the activist investor is going to sue the company and has great <coughs> problems to do it. Okay. Now I know you probably have questions about some of the mechanics in this, and I'm throwing a lot at you. Okay, but all I really want you to focus to right now, as we finish out this particular segment, is to think about replicating all of this. <coughs> this is what's on your. Uh, this is what we began the other day. Okay. So let's go ahead and spend the next 20 minutes or so. And with you guys finishing out this forecast structure, because you began it the other day, finishing it out 
so that you can get to the same numbers I've got. Fair enough? 